He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew that he was murdering the cultural tradition in which he had been raised and in which Phil continues to live, rather belatedly. Natural selection and selection under domestication. Phil really whangs on poor Darwin on this one. But Darwin observed, for example, more than 500 varieties of domestic pigeons from powders to giant homers. If you know pigeons at all, powders are really different from giant homers. And he reasoned that natural selection could produce even greater change operating upon the same available heritable variation. Natural selection for Darwin and for his readers who took it seriously and believed him no undermined the argument from design. Now, if you accept the argument of natural selection, then, of course, you cannot see intelligent design even in butterflies or apes or even pandas or whatever the panda's eating. He gradually came to understand that the implications of his conception of evolution were profound and not only difficult for him to accept, but impossible for him to reject. And let's see what they are. First, the argument from design fails. There are no intelligent designers visible in the natural world. When mammals die, they are really and truly dead. No ultimate foundations for ethics exists. No ultimate meaning in life exists. And free will is merely a human myth. These are all conclusions to which Darwin came quite clearly. Modern evolutionary biology not only supports Darwin's belief in evolution by descent and his belief in natural selection, but all of the implications that Darwin saw in evolution have been strongly supported by modern evolutionary biology. Modern evolutionary biology has a great deal more evidence for evolution by descent than Darwin had. For example, we now have a lot of molecular evolution by descent. What does this mean, molecular evidence for evolution by descent? What we have is a way of looking, and even sequencing DNA ge genomes, and looking at the differences between two apparently related organisms. What we can do is see to what extent they share genomes and they don't. When you do this for humans and chimpanzees, by a variety of different techniques and by using different parts of the genome, we can see that they share some 99% of their genome. Domestic breeding has had tremendous success in the 20th century and continues to. Observations upon natural selection in the wild have been carried out in large part since 1950, but they occupy a good part of evolutionary biology today. Plate tectonics has shown us a lot about the movement of plates on the Earth's surface, but it also has helped us to understand geographical distributions of animals and plants, both living and fossil, and the correlations between what we understand of plate movement and what we can see of both fossil and living forms is a very strong evidence for evolution by shared descent. We know a great deal more now about fossil formation, most of which basically supports what Darwin believed, and we have a great deal more fossil evidence. Now, I have to introduce Phil's bull at this point. I really appreciate Phil's general point of view. I used to share it myself, and I'll say something more about that in just a few minutes. I used to, he's a Presbyterian, and I used to be one. This is Phil's bull. Now, I'm not going to make that bull appear again unless Phil says something that is bull. So the bull is going to go off stage at this point. And when it's out of the way, we'll get some quotes from Phil and see whether the bull has to come out again. Bye-bye, bull. We'll see you later, maybe. Only if we need you. Let's look at Phil on artificial and natural selection. He just told you that artificial selection has definite limits to the amount of variation that even the most highly skilled breeders can achieve. 
Dogs do not change into elephants because, quote, dogs do not have the genetic capacity for that degree of change. And they stop getting bigger when the limit is reached. I suppose the limit is reached now. Well, let's see. Ah, oh, ah, Phil, there's the bull. Darn it, there's the bull. Let's see about artificial selection. Let's see how far it can go. They, breeders do, in fact, run out of heritable variation sometime. But recombination and new mutation means that the limits that Phil claims simply don't exist. Let's look at some of the evidence for this. Let's look at long-continued selection experiments. Oil and protein content of corn that have been going on since the turn of the century. They have reached no limits. They're going strong today. The upper and lower lines of both oil and protein content are still going right ahead. Fecundity in chickens. I grew up on a chicken farm. Chickens are getting more and more fecund. They lay more eggs now than when I was a kid. The ratio of fat to lean in hogs. Coat colors in fancy mice. I don't care. Just go to an animal or plant breeding book. You can find lots of examples. Now let's go to the example of dogs. Now, if we can get chihuahuas in St. Bernard's out of wild wolves in just a few thousand years, Phil wants us to believe that we can't go any farther. Well, wait a minute. Sure we can go farther than that. We can make dogs the size of rats and buffalo. It wouldn't even take a few million years. I suspect only a few tens of thousands of years. And not only that, they would be what we call species. They would be different species indeed. Where does Phil get the information that artificial selection just comes to an end? That there are limits in the size to which dogs could be selected to be? I don't know where he knows the limits are. Animal and plant breeders certainly have not found them. Let's look at Phil on natural selection. Hey. He believes in evolution. He even tells you. He'll give you Hawaiian Drosophila as a case of evolution by naturalistic causes. He says, there's no reason for believing that natural selection can produce new species, new organs, or other major changes, or even minor changes that are permanent. Hey, let's look at Hawaiian Drosophila. The older and newer species of Hawaiian Drosophila differ in major morphology, head shape and size, internal organs, and they most certainly deserve to be called different species. More than 20 million generations separate some of these. And when you do DNA-DNA hybridization or you sequence genomes and compare them, the genetic distances are quite large. And so you got a problem. You admit that the differences between Hawaiian Drosophila species have evolved by natural means. You deny that humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor. But the fact is that the morphological and genetic differences between old and new Hawaiian Drosophila species is far greater than the differences between humans and chimps. So what should you do, Phil, in the future? What you've got to do is to argue that God created different species of Hawaiian Drosophila. Otherwise, you're going to be inconsistent. Now, evolution of highly adapted things is really tough. And Phil says that you can't get the evolution of a wing for the following reason. Four limbs evolving into wings would probably become awkward for climbing or grasping long before they became very useful for gliding thus placing the hypothetical intermediate creature at a serious disadvantage. I have a feeling that the bull is coming. Bull. Phil, there are organisms that glide, and they don't lose the ability of their limbs to climb or to jump. I love flying squirrels. We've raised a great number of them. They fly like crazy, and they also can jump, and they grasp upon trees perfectly well. Incidentally, they separated from the regular old gray tree squirrels about 35 million years ago. So when creationists tell me that a flying squirrel is one of God's kinds, it belongs to the squirrels, 
I return by saying, gosh, you know, humans and chimpanzees shared a common ancestor five to seven million years ago, and these squirrels that you say are all one of God's